Um, I'm going to organize my remarks uh, with a bit of an overview of what we mean by democratic transitions, then talk about some of the implications that has for conflict uh, on the continent, and then finish up looking at what does that mean for security sector professionals on the, on the continent. And I'd like to start with uh, the case of Gambia. On January 22nd, uh, 2017, Yawa Jame uh, boarded a plane out of Banjul uh, for the last time as the leader of that country after being in power for 22 years. And his exit, uh, negotiated with the help of ECOWAS, um, allowed Adama Baro, the uh, duly elected candidate from the December elections, to take office and to begin the process of uh, political reform in Gambia. Uh, uh, President Barrow's uh, election was hailed by many Gambians. Um, he was the, the most popular candidate, and uh, it ushered in a, a period of expectancy among many in the country that after 22 years uh, of uh, what was at times repressive rule, the country is ready to, to turn the page and regain its democratic trajectory. Um, the fact that this was done without uh, violence was hailed as a, as a great success. And so in the minds of many people, um, Gambia is, is treated as a, as a successful democratic transition on the continent. Yet, uh, I would argue that, uh, in fact, Gambia is just at the beginning of its transition. Um, when we talk about democracy, um, it isn't just about an election, or isn't just about changing leaders. It isn't a single event, but democracy is a process. It's a governing process that involves, among other things, um, adherence to the rule of law, checks and balances on the executive uh, branch. Um, it, it involves uh, um, uh, access to political rights and civil liberties for all citizens, regardless of uh, whether your candidate won. Um, it's a matter of uh, protecting minority rights um, at all times. Um, <clears throat> Democracy is uh, about uh, maintaining transparency and about creating incentives uh, within your governing processes to, um, to try to provide benefits for ordinary citizens. In short, democracy is about building institutions that create these characteristics in a society rather than than a single moment or a single event. And this is important in Africa because um, many African countries are in this place right now on their political trajectories where they've made some democratic progress. And in fact, nearly every country in Africa today has some elections. Um, yet uh, the institutionalization process is still ongoing. And in fact, just counting them up, we could classify about 23 African countries today in this category of, uh, of undergoing democratic transitions. This is in, an, in addition to seven countries which are considered to have crossed the democratic threshold in their institution building. So this is a common phenomena. Uh, it's an ongoing phenomena. Um, that uh, is quite relevant to Africa's current political and security context. So what are some of the lessons we've learned uh, in looking at these transitions, not just in Africa actually, but around the world, where um, since the early 1990s, we've seen uh, many countries uh, begin down the road to democratic reform. I would highlight a few things First, that democratic transitions are challenging. Um, in fact, in Africa, 65% uh, 
of the countries that have started down the path of democracy have at one time uh, uh, had uh, a regression. They've, they slid backwards, uh, at least for a period of time. Um, though, to put that in context, of those who've, who've had some backsliding, two-thirds of those ultimately resume a positive trajectory after a period of three years. Um, so it reflects that the process of, of democratic change is not linear. Uh, there tends to be bumps on the road along the way. Um, think about the case of Mali. Um, Mali was moving very uh, positively in the eyes of many on a democratic path, uh, but there, you know, they, they faced a security challenge in the north, uh, there was a coup, and, and, and they quickly fell backward in terms of their uh, political um, governance structure. Yet, uh, within a, a short period, a period of two to three years, um, they were able to reconstruct uh, their key political institutions, they held elections, and they were able to reinstitute a civilian government there. So there are no quick democratic successes, um, but nor are there permanent failures. Um, this is an ongoing process. Uh, the next uh, quality that I would highlight is that um, since democratic transition strengthening is an is a institution building process, it takes time. Institutions take time to build. Often, uh, it's often a decade or long, longer period of, uh, of effort. And so to be successful, you need to sustain the reform effort over time. It can't just be one enthusiastic push uh, and, and move out some uh, you know, leader who's been in power for a long period of time. Um, it's a matter of actually creating the institutions that are then going to be able to sustain progress uh, over time. And this process is, is particularly challenging because that institution building process doesn't start from a level playing field. Often you've had years or decades where one leader has been in power and they've created a legacy of autocratic structures that are very hard to undo. Um, they uh, may have uh, established you know, strong patronage networks within the society that are exclusive of large percentages of the population. They may be favoring one group or region um, or, or political party. And uh, this political monopoly often translates into economic monopolies. And at times, this uh, ensnares members of the security uh, sector. And so there are um, a number of key institutions, key individuals, who have benefited under this system. And they won't want to see that changed. And so even though you have a new leadership, those institutional structures haven't changed. And they're going to push back. There's going to be resistance. There's going to be attempts to undermine the democratic process. And indeed, some of the volatility that we see in democratic transitions can be attributed to this struggle, this ongoing struggle for control over the levers of power in these societies that are trying to make change. And we've seen, actually, that there is a correlation between the length of time that a country has been under autocratic rule and the difficulty in, in reforming those institutions over time. So the longer there's been autocratic rule, the more entrenched these institutions are, and often the harder it is then to create new institutions that are going to be more responsive to citizen concerns uh, more transparent, more accountable, that create checks and balances. 
So this brings us to the question of what are the security implications of democratic transitions on the continent? And to do this, we need to put the discussion in the context of the broader um, topic of governance and governance and conflict. And on this, we see a very clear relationship between poor governance and conflict in Africa. Of the 12 African countries uh, in conflict today in Africa, 10 of them are autocratic. And in fact, uh, looking at data from 1990 to the present, we see that countries with autocratic governments are, have a 25% probability of being in conflict three years hence um, from any given time period over, over uh, that era. So there's a propensity for conflict among uh, autocracies. Again, this isn't just in Africa. Um, this phenomena this is something we see, see globally. Uh, moreover, within Africa, um, over 90% of all uh, uh, internally displaced people and uh, refugees originate in autocratically governed countries. Three quarters of all fragile states in Africa are, are autocratic in nature. <clears throat> and we see that this pattern holds even at the local level. So today, most African conflicts, as you know, are internal conflicts. And typically, they don't encompass the whole country, but they emerge out of specific regions. These regions tend to be among the most marginalized in a given country. Um, and so that comes down to governance. Um, a particular group, uh, region is disadvantaged economically, politically, socially, um, and this restiveness then can be uh, amplified and, and turn into armed conflict. So the fact that, you know, the flip side of this is that democratically governed societies tend to be more stable and more peaceful. Um, in fact, uh, among Africa's democracies, the probability of conflict um, since 1990 is less than 1% over any three-year period um, uh, compar comparatively. And this falls in line with the, the often referenced concept of the democratic peace, the idea that democracies tend not only not to fight one another, but they also tend to avoid conflict uh, more generally uh, within their own borders. And we can go into more detail on that if interested uh, later on. So we've established, you know, autocracies tend to be more uh, conflict prone, democracies tend to be more stable. How about the countries in transition? And for this, we see, in fact, that Democratic transitions in Africa have been more uh, volatile than democracies, but the record suggests that they, they're less volatile than what we see among autocracies. Specifically, the probability of conflict for, dem for democratizers, countries in transition, is about 10% in any, for any given year looking forward for the next three years. Um, and so, it's about a 40% less likelihood of conflict than what we see among autocracies. <clears throat> now, the challenge that we see um, in any context, but especially for countries that are undergoing democratic transitions, is when there's already been conflict, how do you um, emerge from that? And in fact, the statistics show that of countries that have been in conflict, 50% are likely to fall back into conflict within five year period on average. Um, it is the so-called <clears throat> conflict trap that uh, once the dynamics of conflict take hold in a society, it's hard to emerge from that. 
And there's a number of reasons for that, but you know, they revolve around the fact that once society is polarized, once politics is polarized in society, uh, uh, once animosities between groups have been built up and the norm of using violence to resolve differences is established, it's hard to break, break out um, of that pattern. And so this is a challenge when we talk about democratic transitions in post-conflict environment. So what does this mean for security sector actors as you, um, you know, look at your roles in uh, navigating through democratic transitions in your respective societies? And um, before sharing a few thoughts, I wanted to draw atten your attention to some of the excellent, excellent work that some of your facilitators have done on this. And uh, um, for those of you who haven't seen, Emil Wadrago has published this uh, uh, research paper with us. It's called Advancing Military Professionalism in Africa. And he talks about some of the, the challenges uh, that African militaries have faced in trying to strengthen their security sector institutions. And uh, my friend and colleague, uh, Matt Hunipo, has written this security brief entitled, uh, Africa's Militaries, A Missing Link in Democratic Transitions. It's another excellent piece of work, uh, which I encourage you to take a look at um, if you haven't already. So, so coming back to the question, you know, what, what, what does this mean, given what we've just talked about in looking at the context and the politics of democratic transitions, what does this mean for security sector actors? I would throw out thoughts for three different, um, at three different levels here. And at the first level is the importance of not adding fuel to the fire. So recognizing that uh, the beginning of a transition environment is often starting from a, a place of polarization. You've had this legacy of autocratic institutions and, and possibly conflict. You've had this exclusive governance structure that may be patronage based. Um, and as a security sector actor, um, you're going to be uh, a target of politicians who want to immerse you in that uh, dynamic. They will want support, either uh, based on financial incentives or other privileges. Um, they will want to politicize the security sector to advance their own political interest. And so recognizing that and uh, resisting that, I think, is particularly important so that the situation isn't exacerbated and that potentially fragile time you're going into um, isn't, uh, isn't worsened. And in the process, um, uh, you'll be challenged really to uh, maintain the integrity and institutional professionalism of your service um, at the, you know, at the, at the uh, request of these political actors. Now, aside from the, um, you know, the potential that this has for um, the use of coercive force in a society, it's important to recognize that um, the actions of a security sector have broader implications on norms in a society. That um, research shows that when a security sector is perceived to be politicized and or corrupt, that the likelihood of violence increases uh, dramatically. Um, basically, citizens uh, conclude that the only way they're going to protect themselves or protect their interest is by arming themselves or by violating the law. And so your choices as security sector actors um, transcend just the security sector institutions. They have implications for the society more generally. 
All right, the second level of engagement that I would throw out for you is um, simply maintaining an apolitical, the importance of maintaining an apolitical posture for the security sector. A good example of this is in Nigeria following the death of President Yardura in May of uh, 2010. And there were many pressures at that time on the Nigerian military to, to step in. Because as you might recall, President Yardura had not identified a successor formally, and there was a lot of uncertainty about how things would proceed. And of course, Nigeria has a long history of military leaders stepping in, and uh, there was pressure to do so. Um, and the Nigerian Army Chief of Staff at that time, Lieutenant General Adhuraman Dambazao, issued a, a statement during that, those tense days, reiterating the military's apolitical role in Nigeria. He said, it is a difficult time for everybody, but we believe that it is a political thing. We are not politicians. We are military professionals and we are determined to remain so. Nobody, no matter what, no matter the effort, will drag us into it. So that position by the Nigerian military at that very delicate time in Nigerian history helped calm down the atmosphere, helped maintain the political neutrality of the military and allowed the political process to, um, to evolve and, 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 and emerge from that crisis. In the process, it uh, created the time and space so that Nigeria's democratic institutionaliz institutionalization process could proceed. And this has provided many benefits for the Nigerian military as well. As well, as I should add, um, for the career of General Dambazao, who is still highly regarded and is today the Minister of Interior in Nigeria. The third level um, of uh, engagement that I would throw out for you to consider in democratic transitions is um, the option of actively engaging a transition to help uh, enhance the institution building process within your um, respective institutions. Um, again, the security sector, specifically the army and, and, and the police, in many African countries is often among one of the most um, advanced institutions within your societies. Um, you'll often have organized units from the village level on up, at, up to the national level. There's a command and control structure, there's communications, there's resources. Um, there's logistics. Um, and so the security sector brings um, significant institutional capacity uh, into the discussion about uh, institution building within democratic transitions. And so the norms that are created within the security sector are going to transcend the rest of the society. And again, recognizing the starting point of many democratic transitions, where, are, where are these, there, there are these many negative legacies, transitions provide an opportunity to strengthen the security sector institutions, to depoliticize the institutions, to, to, to de-ethnicize uh, security sectors that may have been skewed towards one group over another. In the process, by being inclusive, um, the security sector has a chance to, to really contribute to nation building, to create a sense that this is a, a genuinely national army or national police um, that represents all parts of the society. And, and indeed, there's been some interesting work done showing how African militaries where you have uh, individuals from different ethnic groups, often rivals, training together you know, young enlisted uh, service members 
when they're training together, when they're taking on tasks together. Um, within a very short period of time, they're able to break down prejudices. They're able to, to see how they have shared interest. And that perception um, uh, has a, a dramatic unifying effect on the service and for the country more generally. And so there's a real opportunity in transitions to try to, um, to strengthen national identity and to rebuild trust within society by the actions of the security sector. And the more stability that the security sector can provide during those early months and years of a transition, that provides time, that provides the buffer that society needs to work out some of these other <laughs> political challenges that are faced. And in the process, avoid the polarization and the pull back down into the conflict trap that so many face. And indeed, I would suggest that's uh, what we've been seeing in Tunisia following their transition. And there, uh, after the 2011 um, uh, revolution, um, you know, we saw President Ben Ali had tried to use security forces um, to uh, um, crack down on, on protesters who are calling for his removal. Um, the military in that case um, didn't act on those orders. You know, they, 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 uh, you know, they decided they, that the, they were going to adhere to the constitutional rule of what their rule was. Um, and uh, seeing that he didn't have that course of capacity, Ben Ali left the country. Um, the army, in this case, uh, gained enormous legitimacy and, and respect of the population. Um, and it has continued to play that buffering role in Tunisia's transition, you know, which has not been easy. They continue to face challenges. Uh, but in the process, the, the society has had the time to try to work out the differences and set itself on a new course. And this has been true for the Tunisian military as well. So let me stop there. <laughs>